Hello, everyone, and welcome to the January meeting of the St. John Naturalists Club. So today we have Shauna Sands from ACAP St. John, who will be speaking on microplastics. Um, so more on that in a little bit. I just want to do a couple announcements for our club. Um, so next Thursday, we have Birding Around St. John with Suzanne Bunnell. Um, she's going to be um, over on the west side this week, um, starting at 9 a.m. Uh, more details are on our website and uh, will be on Facebook soon. But um, new birders are welcome. So we have some binoculars that we can loan out to anyone that doesn't have a pair. And we hope that you can join us. Next month, um, Thursday, or I'm sorry, Saturday, the 11th of February, we have our uh, members meeting, which had to be rescheduled. It was originally going to be in December. And so that's going to be in person at River Cross Church at 10 a.m. And our club members are going to be sharing different stories and experiences that they've had in the natural world. And we hope that you can join us then. And then the following Saturday on the 18th of February, we have our next webinar, which is going to be with Alfredo Giusto, and it's going to be on um, mushrooms and the different biodiversity of uh, chanterelles in our region. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to Mary, who's going to introduce Shona. Thanks, Julie, and good morning, everyone. Um, for technical difficulties, I am going to stay off camera today. I can either talk or be on camera, but I can't do both apparently at the same time. So um, I'm really pleased this morning uh, to welcome Shauna Sands. Shauna is the conservation coordinator at the Atlantic Coastal Action Program, ACAP St. John. Born and raised in St. John, Shauna has always been passionate about marine species and their environment. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology from the University of New Brunswick in St. John and a Diploma in Wildlife Conservation Technology from Holland College. Shauna's interests include topics related to wildlife management and conservation, marine mammals, especially cetaceans, and educational outreach. So today, it is now my pleasure uh, to pass the microphone and uh, ask Shauna to join us. Welcome, Shauna. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Mary, Julie, and the rest of the team. Um, so I'll just pull up my slides here now. Um, to do just you can give me a thumbs up if you can see that perfect okay so uh today we're going to talk about um, identifying microplastics in the saint john harbor and that's a project that we at acap have been working on um over the last couple of years so First, I'll just kind of go over what ACAP St. John is for those who don't know. So we're an environmental organization um, right in the heart of St. John near the St. John Harbor, where we do a ton of different projects, um, all related to the environment. We do fishing monitoring, tree plantings, cleanups, harbor seal monitoring. Um, we do a lot of water quality as well. So we're going out and taking the quality of the water at um, about 30 different sites across the St. John area. And most recently, we've been doing some microplastics work. So I'll just go through the agenda for today. So we're going to talk about why do we care about plastic waste and what does that mean? Um, what are microplastics? What current research is being done by ACAP St. John and other researchers around the Maritimes? And what you can do at home to help. So first, I just want to show you this picture on the left-hand side. This is uh, the Life magazine's cover in 1955, celebrating the production of throwaway containers. So they were so excited because we now not have to do our dishes anymore. So they're very, very excited about that. Um, so that was in the 1950s. So if you go to the right, you can really see how the global, global plastic production has increased since then and just 
just increased um, so fast. Um, and now we're up to about 400 million tons of plastic is being produced yearly. Um, why do we care about plastic waste? What does this mean? So every year, Canada actually throws away 3 million tons of plastic waste. So this is stuff that is not being recycled properly. About 640,000 tons of abandoned, lost, or fishing gear is entering our oceans. Um, and this sort of plastic can actually persist in the environment for up to 600 years and doesn't degrade. Um, about a third of the plastic is single use plastic here in Canada. So that would be styrofoam, plastic that your lettuce is coming in and those sorts of things. Um, and about 15 billion plastic bags are used every year and close to 57 million straws are used daily. Now, we'll just say that these stats were pulled from 2019. So this was prior to the ban of plastic bags um, in most municipalities and really soon federally, a lot of plastic will be uh, eliminated. So these stats will change, but that was just a couple years ago that we were using this much plastic. Globally, about one garbage truckload of plastic enters our oceans every minute. And 1 million birds and over 100,000 marine mammals worldwide are injured or die when they mistake plastic for food or become entangled. So this isn't necessarily microplastics that they're ingesting. This could be actually the macroplastics. So those are the larger pieces of plastic. So that's what these photos here are. These are some of the species that made the news recently um, that were found to have uh, plastics in their their gut content. I'm sure you've seen this picture of the bird and this picture of the whale. Um, they were pretty pretty blasted across the news, um, and it was it was very eye opening for researchers and environmentalists across the world. And we tr we're trying now to really change um, our plastic use. So what are we doing at ACAP? Um, I mean, we can go on and talk about like, oh, use your reusable bag, make sure you bring your reusable water bottle and those sorts of things. But we like to take action at ACAP, Atlantic Coastal Action Program um, is, is actually our name. So we're, we're in the environment, we're out with our volunteers and we're doing cleanups across the city. Um, I just have some stats that I just pulled out from our 2022 season. So we actually, had 36 cleanup events this year and we picked up um I think we had like 1200 volunteers and we they collected 20,000 pounds of trash and that is incredible for us that's that's something we've never really accomplished before that's a lot a lot of trash and that is the equivalent of one minky whale so I thought that was a really neat stat so um if you're interested in doing an environmental cleanup ACAP can provide bags for the St. John Nationals Club or your community or that sort of thing. And we'll also provide a garbage pickup as well. So um, if that's something you're interested in, we'll provide bags, garbage or bags and gloves and a location and, and the garbage pickup. Um, and if that's something you maybe you don't want to do an event yourself, we can also, we will also have many different spring events. So our, our big Marsh Creek cleanup, we'll have a Dominion Park cleanup in those. So look, look for those events um, if you're interested in participating. So now we'll talk a little bit about the journey of marine plastics. So if there's plastics um, in your neighborhood, it it usually eventually makes it to the beaches and then evidently into the um, into the ocean. So how is it getting there, and, and what does this mean? So um, first, in 1972, was the very first time they really recorded marine plastic debris um, in the ocean. So there was a scientist. He was out on his boat, and he noticed that there was plastic floating in the ocean, and that was the first time he. He really saw that, something like that. 
And so it wasn't even until the 18 or 1986 that the researchers actually began collecting the small amounts of plastics that they were seeing in the ocean. And it was in 1996 that the Great Pacific Garbage Patch was discovered. So if you're not familiar with that, that's a section of, I think it's the Indian Ocean, where all the plastic is just being kind of uh, currented into that one section. And it's just con it's a concentrated. Um, they're all super, super small pieces. So we're not able to really clean it up. And it almost looks like soup, like a, like a murky soup um, instead of, pieces of plastic. And it wasn't even until 2004, so not that long ago, that uh, microplastics, that term was created. So it, in the science world, it's relatively new. So a lot of the research that's out there today um, is quite new. So it, we're not really able to tell you really the effects of microplastics quite yet, but we're working on that and we're trying to get some of that baseline data to see what the concentration of microplastics might be in our oceans and, and how is that affecting not only the wildlife, but the humans as well. So today we're estimating that there's 15 to 51 trillion microplastics floating in the ocean surface from the poles to the equator. So they've been found in the deepest part of the ocean, in the Arctic Sea and in all levels of the food web. So we know it's there, we know it's being found everywhere and what can we do to either mitigate it or remove it? So what are microplastics? Microplastics are anything that is smaller than five millimeters in size. So this picture of a sieve that you see in the background, those pieces of fishing line, the blue pieces, they are actually bigger than five millimeters. So they wouldn't actually count for microplastics. Um, so it would be even smaller than those pieces are considered microplastics. But they're entering our oceans through runoff. So when they're on the beach and they're running off into the ocean with the tides, they can be from clothing. So most of our clothes are actually made out of synthetic fibers. Um, and those are being released every time we do a load of laundry. Microbeads and hygiene products. Now these have been banned in Canada, but they're not actually banned in all parts of the world. So they are still entering the ocean, entering our oceans through that. Fishing equipment, so whenever there's a piece of fishing line that um, they had to cut, the fishermen had to cut and it's released into the ocean, that'll degrade over time and break into smaller pieces and enter, um, our, enter our ocean and as well as beach litter. And a lot of this plastic, so whether it's macroplastics or microplastics can often be consumed by animals. So how does a piece of macro plastic like this straw end up into tiny, tiny pieces? Well, it takes a long time, but um, usually the sun or the waves or the rocks, it, it eventually will break down into smaller and tinier pieces over time. And the majority of the microplastics, like I said, are, are almost invisible to us to see. So this is kind of on a scale um, next to a ruler. You can see like five millimeters is, is quite small and almost impossible to really remove it from the water column. So we have here the types of microplastics that we can find in our oceans. You'll see later that our results, um, we actually have these types broken down into further broken down. So for example, Fragments um, are smaller pieces of larger pieces of plastic. So um, that would just be like a straw, for example, if that, that would be a fragment. Fibers are common types of microplastics, um, usually from clothing or from fishing line. So in our results, we'll have the fibers broken up into microfibers. So that would be from your clothing and threads, and that would be from fishing line. Um, we also have foam, so that would be styrofoam cups. 
Nurdles is um, industrial plastics. Um, so that would be really hard pieces of plastic that um, industrial or industrial businesses um, spewed out. And we also have those micro beads that I talked about in the last slide. So that would be tiny little pieces of plastic that are in our soaps um, and our, our toothpaste and that sort of thing. Um, and later on, you'll also see we have a category for film, which um, is plastic bags. So that's different from, from these five you see on the screen. So what are microplastics doing to the aquatic organisms? Um, so we do know that every trophic level in the ocean are being exposed to microplastics, but the health risks are uncertain due to variation of the plastic types like I just talked about, the shape of the plastic, the size of the plastic, and the species and its exposure. So there's a lot of factors that come into play here. Um, ingested microplastics have the impact of biochemical or physiological processes of many different types of animals. So we know that just ingesting microplastics could probably be very harmful to species. We just don't know at what level. Um, they think there might be a potential harmful chemicals as well as plastic additives such as flame retardants, plasticizers, or dyes. So not just the plastic itself, but those other additives that come along with plastics. And what does this mean for us humans? Um, so right now there's very limited information. Like I said before, um, the microplastic research that's being done is quite new. Um, and we're not really able to compare the researchers across the board, the research across the board, because a lot of the methods are so different right now. So we're all trying to come together as much as we can and really um, standardize our methods so that we're able to compare results. How do we collect and analyze microplastics? So there's different types of collection. So you could do sediment. Um, if you're looking for microplastics in sediment, you would take up a, a sediment core and take up a, a sample of the sediment. You can take surface water trawl. So that's this picture here on the left. Um, you drag that trawl along the surface of the water and you're able to kind of funnel all the plastics at the back there. Um, you would then take that sample and you'd put it under the microscope and you could visually detect microplastics. So that's taking the time to pull out any of the organic stuff and keeping the inorganic and then sorting that based on the types of microplastics that I mentioned before. So fragments, is it a thread? Is it a film and that sort of thing? Or if you had lots of research money, you could use FTRI imagery, which uses chemical ID methods to recognize, count, identify, and classify um, sizes of microplastics. I know one sample, like if you were to put one sample in an FTIR machine, it would cost, I think it's like $450 a sample. So it's very, very expensive. I said ACAP, we've never had the funds to do that, but we are, um, I'll talk about it later, but we're, we're in the, we'll, we're teaming up with uh, UMB St. John um, and Heather Hunt and her team, and she will be actually taking some of the samples that we've already collected in the past, and they'll be putting them into the FTIR uh, machine to see um, if the visual, the analog, it, the, vis, the visual, analysis um, compares to uh, what they found in FTIR. So what really kickstarted our microplastics research at ACAP St. John was we were approached by Coin Atlantic over in Nova Scotia um, and they had some funding to look at microplastics in the St. John Harbor. So this um, two lines here um, one in orange and one in blue. These are our trawl lines. So we had to drag the trawl across these lines for 120 minutes each in order to get a big enough sample size.
Sorry to interrupt, Shauna. Um, your audio cut out um, just right after you were saying the um, big enough sample size, just like uh, 30 seconds ago. No, nope, can't hear you yet. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, what I'm not sure what every what um what got cut out, but I can go back a slide. Um, yeah, you just, just um said that you that to get a big enough sample size, you had to drag it for 120 minutes. Correct. Yeah. So um, we did the two trials. So one in the outer harbor and one in the inner harbor. So just above and below the reversing falls bridge. So this next slide is just a quick video of what our trial looks like um, as it's dragging across the surface water. So we had some summer students build us this trawl. Um, it was actually quite cost efficient. We um, were able to get the size mesh um, made for us by a fishing company. So that was really neat. And for the most part, it's just a wooden frame with a PVC pipe being floated up. So the water is able to just kind of filter through and being caught at the caught end here in the back. So here's some photos of us um, with our trawl. Uh, we, we went out in November. So as you can see, we're, we're quite uh, dressed. We're dressed very warm. Um, we also tried to wear as much uh, natural fibers as possible, but that was easier said than done considering the weather. But we did have to send away um, a contamination kit. So we had to pull threads from our clothes and send those with our samples when we when we sent them away for analysis so that we could make sure that if they were to find the, the colored threads that we were wearing in our sample that we would know that we just contaminated our own sample. Um, and same as with the yellow rope on the trowel itself, we had to send those threads along with it. I um, it was, it's really interesting when you think about like our trowel itself is probably 50% made out of plastic. So um, when you're doing microplastic sampling, there's just so much contamination that could happen, but it's so unavoidable as well when, when you're really thinking about plastics. But um, so as you can see, uh, we had to make sure that we were grabbing every single piece of plastic. So um, we're taking this uh, fertilization hose and we're making sure that we're getting every nook and cranny within the trowel itself so that we can get every single piece of plastic. So as you can see, we didn't just catch microplastics, we also caught macroplastics. So this a uh, big piece of plastic is from a cable tie of the ferry, um, as well as you can see these blue threads again. So we have to make sure that we rinse off every single piece of seaweed and put that in our sample as well. It's quite time consuming. Um, so we didn't do any of the, the analysis ourselves. We actually sent our samples away to Memorial University. They have a microplastics lab and they had a student that went through all of our samples, but they provided us with some photos. So as you can see, these are examples of microfibers right here, um, as well as here too. You can kind of see one right here and here too. So here are our, our results from the, our 2018 study. So as you can see, um, both the inner and the outer harbor mostly had microfibers. So those are synthetic fibers that are found from our clothes. But we also found threads in the outer harbor, um, which could relate to a lot of the fishing that goes on it in the outer harbor. 
as well as fragments, foam, and film. So these are the calculated densities um, from our microplastic samples. So we took the amount of water that flows through our microplastic trawl and then times that by the amount of um, surface water that we went through. So in total, we had more microfibers in the inner harbor than in the outer harbor, but we had significant numbers of, of most things. Um, it is important to note that we didn't have any microbeads or those pellets, so those nurdles that uh, I mentioned back um, a few slides ago, which is interesting considering we live in a very industrial um, in, um, area. So the total density of plastic in the inner harbor was lower than in the outer harbor. However, these densities in both sites are actually similarly lower when compared to other studies um, in larger lakes and streams. Um, and these low densities in the St. John Harbor were contrary to what was expected because of the level of industry that we have here, which we thought was really interesting, um, considering we have not just industry, but we have a lot of tourism in the area, um, municipal inputs, and aquaculture that goes on. However, when you do say, well, you know what, maybe St. John is not so bad, um, we really have to take into consideration that the St. John population is a lot smaller when compared to many parts of the world where plastic densities were higher. So that's why our plastic densities were quite a bit lower than, than, those, de than those papers. However, any density of plastic in the harbor is above background levels. So, and it is not natural in our landscape. So, and we really need to consider, even though our plastic densities were uh, considerably lower, um, there should be zero. So um, we really need to figure out how we can at least mitigate our plastic input into our oceans. Well, Canada is, they're finally stepping up. Um, like I mentioned before, microbeads are banned in, um, in Canada. So Canada doesn't sell toothpaste or soaps that have microbeads in them. However, they're not banned yet in other countries. And it's very easy to get your hands on these hygiene products that you might that might be selling them. So if you're buying anything from overseas, just um, make sure you're looking at the ingredients to make sure that there is no no none of those micro microbeads um, in them. And as of just a couple weeks ago, straws, bags, and plastics will no longer be made in Canada. Um, they are slowly phasing them out. And I know a lot of municipalities already don't have bags and they already have bag or shopping bag bans. So, but this is more federal. Um, so this picture here on the right, you can see this will be a lot of um, takeout or, or restaurants, they'll, they'll no longer be able to have styrofoam food containers, straws, and cutlery. They'll have to provide an alternative. So whether that's the cardboard method or a more compostable solution. Um, I think they're giving them a year to really phase it out because a lot of um, companies already have a, a stock of these. So It'll take a while, but I think it's a huge step towards um, single use plastics being a lot limited in our in our country. So related work that's being done um, over in Nova Scotia, if you're familiar with Coastal Action, they're a very similar organization to ACAP St. John, just over on the Lunenburg side. So they had the, the same trawl that we used and did some plastic um, microplastic uh, surface water trawls 
And it's interesting when you compare their results to our results. So um, we had mostly microfibers found in our uh, samples where they had a lot of fragments found in their samples. Um, they sampled in Home Bay, um, in Newfoundland, and on the other side of the Bay of Fundy. So we thought, well, why don't we work with them? They have the resources and the knowledge. We have the resources and the knowledge. Why don't we take some samples together and do a comparison of the Saint or of the Wolstuck um, watershed and the Gulf of St. Lawrence? So we ACAP St. John is partnered with Coastal Action through their Environmental um, Environment and Climate Change Canada AEI um, project. And we are also partnering with Prince Edward Island organizations, um, the Deck Bay and um, the Winter River Watershed. And we are taking samples in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Wolstuck. And we'll be looking at the quantities, types and impacts of microplastics in freshwater environments. So we, ACAP St. John, went out in 2021 and we did three surface water trawls. So you can see here the lines. So again, these were 120 minute trawls. So we did one um, near the Digby Ferry Terminal and one near Redhead Beach, as well as one in the Kennebecasis River. Uh, so we launched our vessel right by the Hampton River Center. Um, and we went up and down um, just underneath the bridge there in Hampton. We chose the sites on the left because uh, Krista Beardy from University of New Brunswick, she is doing all the analysis for this project. And she was also looking at blue mussels and the amounts of plastics that were found in their gut content. So we were able to pick these sites because there's also blue mussels found near the Digby Ferry Terminal Beach as well as Redhead Beach. So we can compare the results from our surface water trawls with the blue mussel uh, microplastics. And we did some more trawls in this, this past year in 2022. So we did three surface water trawls. We did one in Belle Isle Bay. We did one in Grand Bay near the, uh, the ferry as well as uh, Meehan's Cove um, towards like Gondola Point Ferry. Um, so again, those were 120 minute trawls. We took all those samples and we sent them to Krista Beardy and, and the University of St. John. We also took sediment samples. So we had to take a transect of the beach, a hundred meter transect and do four um, one by one meter squared sediment grabs. So we just took the surface of the sand, put that in a bucket and sieved through all of the rocks and the sand and picked out any plastics that we might see. And we were also really lucky um, in this past year in 2022, some of our um, staff were able to jump on the students on ice vessel uh, for a week and they took our surface water trawl that you can see there and they did a transect in the musquash estuary. Um, and you can even see there Aiden in, in the picture in the middle, he's holding, he caught a little lobster in the trawl. So that was really exciting for them. Um, they had a great time. So our results from all of these are, sorry, I'm gonna have to say it's stay tuned. Um, where we were not funded, th this project is, is funded um, through the Environment and Climate Change Canada, but it's actually being um, hosted by Coastal Action. It is their project. We're just doing the field work for it. We just don't have those results quite yet. Um, so they're doing a lot of the analysis for that now, and it'll wrap up um, in March of 2023. So we should have results in the next couple months. So, but what does all this mean? Yes, we're finding plastics, um, but what does that mean for the St. John Harbor? 
So we know from our 2018 results that microfibers were the most commonly found type of microplastics in our harbor. But where are these fibers coming from? So we know that synthetic fibers are found from our clothes and that they, they are released um, from our clothes every time we do a regular laundry cycle. So what are microfibers? Um, like I said, those are the little tiny pieces of threads that are coming from our clothes. It's estimated that 4.8 million tons of synthetic microfibers, so polyester and nylon, are entering our water bodies um, since 1950, so since we really started doing laundry. Um, and, and really when we started using synthetic fiber. So if everybody wants to take a minute to look at what their shirt is made out of, I can tell you right now, oh, mine is 100% cotton, um, which is technically a natural fiber, but it's also dyed with um, unnatural dyes. So um, although it, uh, it is a natural fiber, it's the dyes might have an effect on the wildlife and the, the marine environment that we're just really not sure um, what those effects are. And researchers are now focusing on understanding ways um, that these microfibers shed their sources and the pathways to the environment and what technologies can capture these microfibers so they're not being released into our waterways. We know that laundry textiles are the number one, or well, maybe not the number one, but a really large contributor to microfibers and to the environment. Um, it's estimated that microfibers um, are shed uh, and thousands of microfibers are shed during one uh, load of laundry. Um, this one says a thousand to a million microfibers. So it's really like, that's a very big margin. So it's really dependent on the types of clothes, the types of, um, the, the type of washing machine you might have and that sort of thing. So what can we do? Well, maybe wash your clothes less often. Um, I always like to joke, like do the sniff test. Like, does it really need to be washed? Is it really that stinky? Did you just wear it for a couple hours? Likely if you just work for a couple hours, you can fold it and put it back into your, into your drawers. Uh, wash your clothes in cold water. So some research that's been done is that there's less microfibers that actually break off your clothes when you wash in cold versus hot. Insert a filter onto your washing machine. So there's a, quite a few different ones out there right now. Um, they're, they've come in all different prices. We'll talk more about the Lint Lover here in a bit, um, but there's alternatives. So the Guppy bag is more like, um, more like a garment bag where you put all your clothes in the garment bag, put that in the wash, and then the lint actually gets collected um, at the top um, of the zipper and you can just pull all that lint off and throw that in the trash. Um, now this is different lint from what you're taking out of your dryer. So this is lint and microfibers that are actually just, you're not even seeing this when you're doing your wash, it's just being completely released um, into your wastewater whether you're on municipal or if you're on a septic uh, tank. Um, France actually will be the very first country in 2025 that will require all new washing machines to have some sort of filter for microplastics. I know there are some already built right now and it's, it is possible that your washing machine already has some sort of filter on it if it's newer. Um, so maybe check into that. Maybe that's maybe you aren't cleaning it as often as, as you should be either. Um, and we do know that plastic microfibers, the, the, the problem itself cannot be solved just by me and you folks um, it, and individuals alone. There's going to have to be a change across all scales and all industries. And we do see that Canada is making a change with banning the single use plastics. And that's really just the first step. So a little bit about the lint lever. 
Um, so it is a filter that is hooked up to your outside of your washing machine. And essentially all you do is you take your, your discharge hose and you hook it up into this section of the filter and all of the water gets filtered into um, this plastic bit and the lint gets caught into the stainless steel mesh and then the rest of the water goes back out. Um, they, re they recommend that you clean it every two to three weeks or every 10 to 15 loads, so whatever comes first. And um, these are built from an engineer in Nova Scotia, so they're quite local. So we, I'll talk a little bit about it here in a second, but we have a project, an ongoing project right now where we, um, we sent these to citizen scientists across St. John, and uh, he gave us a really good deal on, um, on on these, so it was really fantastic to work with Blair and his team over at um, uh, Environmental Enhancements. So this photo here is a picture of my washing machine with uh, the lint lever hooked up. So as you can see, the discharge hose of my washing machine just goes up into the filter, and as I do a load, the lint gets caught into the filter and the rest of the water uh, goes back out. So as every time I do a load, I just make sure I take a tally of it so that I am i don't have um, an incredible amount of lint in my filter and it gets clogged up. So once I get to about 15 loads, then I'm able to take the, the filter out and clean it. So this is the amount of lint that I collect in about 15 loads. Um, it's very dependent, like I said, on the types of clothes you have, how often you do laundry, um, and that sort of thing. So I know for a family of two, so it's just me and my husband and my dog, it takes me about probably five weeks to get to 15 loads. One, because I'm lazy and I don't like to do laundry. And two, um, we're just two people. So we, we really don't accumulate that much laundry. But we also have a dog. So a lot of the lint in my lint lover is a lot of fur. So back in January of 2022, so just a year ago, we had a very similar presentation that we presented to interested scientists, citizen scientists, and we provided lint levers um, for homeowners. Um, and all we asked in return was that they, they dry their lint um, when they clean their filter, weigh their lint, and then they would provide us with those results. And then they could say that they successfully removed um, plastic from their waterways. So we just asked a few different um, types of information from them. So whether they're on septic or municipal wastewater, if they had a front load or a top load washing machine, if they washed with hot or cold, and how many loads they did before they cleaned their filter. Um, and these types of questions were just so that we could do a little bit of, of data analysis in the end to see if it is true that front load washing machines um, yield more microfibers, if, if cold water yields less and that sort of thing. So we just received our results from our citizen science um, over the last week or two. Um, so citizen scientists have been collecting lint for a year. We had 23 participants. Um, over those 23 participants, they did 2,400 loads of laundry. They removed 1,611 grams of lint. Now I, I broke that up. I think it's like 3.5 pounds of lint, which doesn't seem like a lot, but that is like 3.5 pounds of lint is, is quite a lot of, of, of lint, if you really think about it. Um, and with that data, we did a little bit of math and we thought, we think that there's about 0 0.66 grams of lint being shed every load, every time you do a load. 
so just under a gram, um, which would be about 29,000 microfibers shed a load because research has shown that there's about 45 microfibers per milligram of lint. So we had every load of laundry was just under a gram. So it would be just under 45 microfibers per gram of lint. So overall, a lot of microfibers are being shed per load. And that's without us going through everybody's lint. Um, but I do have some photos later on about, um, uh, we went through some of our lint at, at home. Um, so with a little bit more math, it's estimated that our citizen scientists actually removed 72 million microfibers from our waterways. So they're taking their lint, once it's dry and weighed, they're putting that directly into the garbage and not um, into the, the wastewater or our compost or that sort of thing. So here's actually a picture of our executive director, Roxanne. This is her lint under the microscope. So I don't have any training on um, looking at microplastics through the microscope, but this is what I kind of picked up. So as you can see, there is a little black thread here. So that would be a piece of lint, so a piece of microfiber. She also had a ton of pet hair in her um, in her sample and a lot of organic debris. Um, since we work outside a lot, um, a lot of our, I know my lint is just full of pine needles and little pieces of sand and that sort of thing. So you're really able to see the color microfibers when you pull them out. So um, she had lots of pinks and blues and that sort of thing in her sample. Now that was like just a, a, the tiniest bit of lint that I picked out of her giant um, ball of lint that she dried just from her 15 loads of laundry. So like I said, it's estimated that 45 microfiber pieces are found in just one milligram of lint. And one laundry cycle can shed thousands of microfibers per load. So if this spiked your interest at all, we do have a few filters left. Um, the citizen science portion of this project is, excuse me, is just wrapping up, but we are encouraging participants to keep their filters installed and continue to collect microfibers as they shed during their regular laundry cycle. There will be no longer a need to track your data, so keeping it on your counter drying it, weighing it, and sending us that information. So you can clean your filter, um, just put all of the gunk into the trash. Um, so if you are interested in a lint lover, feel free to send me an email at the end of this and we can certainly hook you up with one. Um, I will say that this project was funded by Environment and Climate Change Canada's Eco Action Project, as well as the Environmental um, trust Fund of New Brunswick. So I am ready to open the floor to questions. Um, I can read these pretty quickly though. Um, or I, I can read the ones in the chat, but also if people want to ask any questions, um, like raise their hand, they can do that as well. I'm just going to pull up the participant list so I can see if anyone's raising their hand. Um, okay, so first question here. That's a good question, Brian. Brian asks, what impacts would the Bay of Fundy tides have on the results? Um, I'm not actually sure, but I think it would probably maybe even pull some of those fibers or plastics away um, and maybe bring them out further into the Bay of Fundy than, than where we're actually collecting them in along the coast. Now, the Huntsman Marine Center has done a lot of microplastic sampling further out into the Bay. Um, I'm not sure if they have their results publicized yet, but they're also on board with 
um, the University of New Brunswick, like I said, with Dr. Heather Hunt, will be doing a lot of analysis on some of the samples that, that have already been collected. Um, so we'll do further analysis on those than that visual analysis. Oh yeah, I see a lot of people had cotton, but dyed materials today. Um, do Mary asks, do micro natural fibers also have detrimental effects on wildlife in the environment? Um, I mean, it's, we don't know yet. We don't know what those effects will be. I mean, absolutely try and wear more natural fibers than synthetic fibers, which is definitely easier said than done because everything out there right now is mostly um, synthetic fibers. But like I said, everything is dyed mostly unnaturally. But and like, unless you can find something that's dyed with a natural color, a natural dye, and is already um, a natural fiber, that would be like best case scenario. But again, we can't we can't just ask everybody to stop wearing clothing, especially where we live in cold climates like Canada. <laughs> um. Vicky says, I was surprised that my new washing machine no longer has a lint filter that captures larger fibers. It's going down the drain and I'm having chronic issues with lint blocking. Glad to see that France will even make better lint traps. Yeah, I agree. I think um, once France um, implements this, I don't think it'll be long before other countries will feel the pressure to as well. Oh yes, Brian says um, Ireland was very blue. So Brian Como is um, one of our citizen science. Um, he's been really great at providing us with his uh, monthly lint weight. Um, and he also finds a lot of pet hair and um, he lives with a couple girls, so a lot of hair as well. Um, but yeah, he's finding about 12 grams a lint um, every 15 loads. Mine is usually about uh, six to seven grams every 15 loads. But again, I'm only, we only live with two people and, and I think he's got a, a household of four. Um, Ray asks, what's the effect on septic systems? Um, so I have read a few studies where depending on if you're on a septic versus municipal wastewater, so it is getting treated at a wastewater treatment plant and same as in your septic, it's, it's, it is being held there, all the microplastics, but in both places, the plastics are, are so small that they're actually getting through those filters. Um, so if, for example, for wastewater treatment plants, they're so small, they're getting through those filters before it's getting released. And with your septic, it's actually getting seeped into our groundwater. And then it's getting into um, our local waterways and then ultimately into the ocean. Um, Genus asks, what should be done with microfiber lint after it's collected from the wash? Um, I throw mine directly into the trash. So it is at least going somewhere and not into our waterways, it is going to our, our local landfill. Um, ba, ba, ba. Vicky says, um, a comment here, I read an article about cotton that says the issue is that growing cotton is harder on the environment and depletes the soil. Oh, that's interesting. I never read that before. And the quality of cotton has gone down much of it is grown in China. The threads are less strong and fray and easily and, and fray more easily. Um, that's why our socks are wearing out faster. Well, that's really interesting. So it's harder to find a fiber that makes sense to target. <laughs> Her plan is to ignore fashion and wear my clothes as long as possible. That's also my um, rule of thumb. It's so funny. I see photos of myself from 10 years ago. And I'll look down and I'm wearing the exact same sweater as I was in that photo. So I'm the same as you, Vicky. Just keep wearing the same clothes. If, if there's no holes in them, there's, there's nothing wrong with them. 
Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Well, that's, that is wonderful, uh, Shauna. Um, I want to thank you for the presentation today. And if there are any other questions, I'm sure um, you wouldn't mind if people contacted you at ACAP St. John. Yeah, um, not at all. Um, my email is just my first name. So Shauna um, at acapsj.org. Okay, that's wonderful. And uh, you've given us um, lots of good information and uh, we'll be anxious to hear what the results are as time goes on. We've only been looking at this for what, uh, 50 years, so not even a, a lifetime really. Um, <clears throat> so we will be watching that and thank you for some practical solutions including wearing our old clothes if we can still <laughs> fit into them in 10 years. Exactly. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so like I said, we do have some filters left. So if any homeowners are interested um, in, in grabbing a filter, feel free to contact me. Um, we have a few participants that they were interested in participating in our citizen science project, but realized it just wasn't gonna work with the placement of their washing machine. So we had a few returned. So if anyone's interested, um, feel free to send me an email or give me a call at the office. We'll hook you up. Excellent. Okay, thanks so much, Shauna. And um, just before we finish off the meeting today, in addition to thanking Shauna and ACAP St. John, um, I also wanna thank everybody who attended today's meeting and uh, invite you to join our next Zoom meeting on February 18th at 10 a.m. with Dr. Alfredo Gusto, the Curator of Botany and Mycology at New Brunswick Museum, who will be speaking about the biodiversity of chanterelles and hedgehog mushrooms. And Julie also mentioned that January 26th, um, you're welcome to join Suzanne Bonnell for Birding St. John outing, and that uh, at nine o'clock, uh, Suzanne will be meeting participants at the West Side Lancaster Mall parking lot across from Shoppers Drug Mart. And then again, February 11th uh, is our Members Day at the River Cross Church, 61 Forbes Drive, St. John. So please be sure to check the uh, St. John Naturalist Club website and Nature St. John's Facebook pages for updates. Again, thanks so much, Shauna. Thank you everyone for attending and have a wonderful day. Bye.